Hello, welcome to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. My name is Samantha Shokin. I manage public programs at the museum, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today's Story Survive session, Toby Levy. Toby was born in Chodoro near Lvov, Poland, what is now Ukraine, in 1933 and grew up in an Orthodox Jewish family. In spring of 1941, the Germans invaded Soviet-occupied Poland, forcing Jews into ghettos a few months later, at which point Toby's family went into hiding. A Polish woman who had been a customer in Toby's father's fabric store took them in, where they remained hidden until they were liberated by the Red Army in 1944. I don't want to give too much away, and Toby is a wonderful storyteller, so I will keep my introduction of her short. Uh, I would just like to encourage our virtual audience to uh, submit your questions into the chat box. We will leave time for a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's program, uh, and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Uh, I also want to remind everyone watching that our program is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube most likely tomorrow. And I will send a link to that recording as well as any relevant links in my follow-up email, which will also go out tomorrow. Um, so that's it uh, for housekeeping. Uh, and now please welcome Toby, who is joining us from her home in Brooklyn today. Hello, Toby. Thank you, Samantha. Beautiful write-up on Toby. <laughs> okay, I won't waste much time. Thank you for and it's my pleasure to be here, and especially when I'm talking to people from all over. It's to me. Um, I hope you learn some details from my story. Anyway, I was born in a very nice home, only a small family. We lived in Chodoro for generations and generations. My grandparents, great grandparents, many, 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 many years ago. The time that I got married, it was beginning to get a little better. My father was a soldier in the First World War, 1914. His name was Moses, Moses Eisenstein. He was 18 years old. He was a soldier for the army, for the German army. At that time, it, it, it was the German empire that, that all of Poland that I was born belonged to. So 1933, to 39, I can't tell you much about anti-Semitism. All I know that it was a lot of, from 37, 38, a lot of going on between the Jews talking between each other. Now you have to remember, we did not have the communications we have today, instantly. So you had to wait, something comes in telling us what's happening in Germany. In Germany, Hitler came to power that same year that I was born, 1933. That's the year the German Jews started feeling that they're not as welcome as they were before. We knew something is happening in Germany and the, we knew, but no one seemed to understand the depth of it and no one was able to add the dots how horrible this is going to end. The Jews have had pogroms, I'm sure you all know what pogroms means, for centuries. They came, they made some chaos in the house, they destroyed some housing, they killed a few people or beat somebody up, and they went to next town. But it revived again and again. And at that time, from 33, when I was born, life was beginning to be a little bit better in Poland. However, when the Germans took power, no longer were the Jews welcome in Germany, and the Polish Jews did not understand it. To me, it looks like, to me, sometimes I compare to today's times. We don't add the two and two, and we don't, we don't look long term. We only look short term, how bad it might get. Anyway, the talking, whatever they were talking, I don't remember much of it, but I do remember once there were the rabbi and the, the, the leadership, the Jewish community sitting in our kitchen. We were not rich, nor poor. We only had two, two rooms. My father had a store. He was a merchant. He was selling yard goods material. And then we lived in the building of my, my paternal grandparents. The whole family lived there. My maternal parents lived, my grandparents lived near the train station because they had this uh, of, uh, dairy, a small dairy farm. 
Uh, most Jews lived next to each other because it belonged to the shul. The shul was within walking distance. And we Jews usually stick to each other. I call it, we had our own made ghetto. We lived next to each other. So I remember this the rabbi and this, this, these elder Jews coming to our house, probably in 1937, 38, and discussing what's happening in the world and not understanding what to do. There was no leadership in the Jewish community to tell the Jews, run, do. There was no leadership. Everybody, they got to, how do we survive? Anyway, to continue on, 1939, Germany made a pact with Russia and divided Europe. I was part, I'm closer to Eastern Europe, closer to Russia. I was occupied by the Russians from 39 on to 41. On the other hand, when my husband was closer to, to Germany, he was occupied by the Germans from 1939. When the Germans walked into his town, they took the men, the young men, and the husbands to labor camps right away. On the other hand, my place, my father realized that the, the Russians, before they walked in, he realized he better get rid of his merchandise from the store. He hid it because this way he's not a rich man. He's a, if you're rich, if, if we were labeled rich, which means bourgeois, you're rich, they would send, put us on the train and send us to Siberia. He didn't want that, so he hid his material. When the Russians came in, he was a simple merchant. He had very little in the store, so he closed the store, gave him a job. Life continued a little bit on the same terms as prior. However, in 1941, the Germans attacked Russia, broke their pact, attacked Russia, and pushed them back. So my town had a train station, a lumber yard, and a sugar factory. So it was a, a very small town, but very vibrant. We had approximately five, maybe less, not more than 5,000 Jews in that area. The young people, the single young people, in fact, two of my father's nephews, were able to get on the train and run with the Russians, because the Russians took the train and ran into deeper Russia. The average person family was impossible to get on, but we understood to get out from German occupied places. So what did my father do? He takes a horse and buggy, loads it up, and we start running. We run, 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 but we can't run fast enough because no one stopped the Germans. The Germans didn't have to fight. Poland put the ammunition down. The Russians didn't fight either. So the Germans occupied each town, just walked in and occupied it. They didn't have to fight. So there was no war. So the trains, to get on the train was impossible. So my father realized that he can't get on the train and the Germans are going faster than he is. He's not able to run away fast enough. So he says to my mom, I think we better off to go back to our hometown. At least there, everybody knows us. So his thinking was already, everybody knows us. So we turn around and come home. We, we unload to our home. A day, or, I think a day or two later, the Germans walked in. Okay. The Germans walked in, the minute they walked in, we lived in center of town, which is called Vinnick, is a square. It's like a marketplace that, that twice a week, the villagers come to, to sell their merchandise and buy what they need. So that's a marketplace. So our, we lived in the, center, in the square. The Germans asked all the Jews to come out into the square. 90% lived next to each other, so they came out. Those that lived a little bit away, I don't think they came because I know my maternal grandparents were not there yet. What I remember so very vivid because I was so small is the boots, the German boots. They never left my mind. Very clean, absolutely gorgeous boots. And the soldiers were so, so tall, so handsome, so 
They didn't look tired, they didn't go through a wall, but all I heard is their voices screaming at us. Not telling, ordering us, but screaming. Screaming, giving us order. From now on, you're no longer citizens. You have any longer rights. You are describing what is yours is ours and what you have to description without an end. And then what did they do? They take one man that has a little of a beard, put him in center town, the center in the square. They cut, that was their symbol of dehumanizing you. They cut his beard. They push him on his hand and feet. A German puts his foot on his back. Just picture that. And they say to us, this is who you are. You have no longer any rights. You have to keep quiet. You need a leader. We need a, one of you should be a leader. So whatever we want, we'll tell the leader. Everybody goes to work. Whatever else was going on, I was kind of shocked to hear. And I'm trying to get my father's attention, I'm pulling his hand, he's on my right hand, I'm saying, why are they screaming? My father never ever screamed at us, I had an older sister, he turns to me and says, quiet, you know what? Since that, that day, I looked at my parents in a different way, as young as I was, what was that, eight, eight and a half, that's all I could be. I looked at them and realized something is not right. And their faces told me not to ask for anything because they can't help me. When we come upstairs, my father tells to my mom, he says, this is the end of all of us. This is not the Germans that I, we knew. It's a different breed of Germans. We have no chance. Unless, he said to my mom, we get help from the outside. He was already looking long term. He was lucky to get a job working in the lumber yard. My mom had to report every day to the Gestapo where she was going to be working. I had an older sister. So my father said to us, you don't go outside in the street when we go to work. And told my sister, her name was Betty, that she has to watch over me. We're staying home. The reason he, he couldn't go out in the street is because we had to wear armbands, a white five inch armband in the center of blue Jewish star. So if I don't wear the armband, the German doesn't know I'm Jewish. I don't look Jewish. I spoke a perfect Polish. However, the Poles or the Ukrainians know that I'm Jewish. They will point it out to the Germans. So I'm a loser there. If I do wear the armband, the German know who I am. I had no chance. My parents' decision was we stay home while they go to work. That went on. Once the, the Germans broke the door, came in, and took whatever they wanted from the house. And we were so petrified. We were standing in the corner and hiding, but they didn't touch us. When the parents came home, the house was empty, and they said what happened, but we were alive, so they were so grateful. They didn't even bother looking what was missing in the house. Only once do I remember of seeing a horrible sight that I don't think I will ever forget. A little girl was sitting on the stoop and crying. A German officer passes by and is annoyed with her. He picks her up in the left hand. With the right hand, he has a pistol, shoots her close range. My sister and I are standing in the window and watching all that. The little girl drops dead. My sister and I look at each other. We've got, we've got terribly frightened. We sat down underneath the table and waited for our parents to come home. When they came home, we tell them what happened. They don't explain. My father turns to my sister and says, from now on, don't you dare look in the window. Sit underneath the table. No discussion on the issue. My father was lucky. He had a job working the lumber yard. What was the luck? Because not only Jews worked there, non-Jews too. Like was, he, Jews were slave labor, but the Poles and Ukraines worked in the lumber yard. One time, one of the guys that my father knew all his life comes over to, to my father, says, Moshe, it's going to be a grabbing, a aktia. Aktia means they grab you. They come to the house, they chase you out, they hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. 
pick you up. Either they shoot you on the place or they put you on the train, take you out. That's called an accident. He says to my father, you better find a good hiding place, not just behind the door or on the roof. My father comes home, tells my mother, and he's thinking to find a good hiding place. I'm, I'm always at awe at my father. He probably had no more than four, four, four or five grades because at 18, he was already a soldier in the army and he came back and he went back to school, but he was brilliant. He wasn't an engineer, but he could just figure everything out. So he fit, every house in Europe has a cellar. A cellar is a full flight down into deep, deep in the earth. Don't forget, going back 75, 85 years, there was no refrigerators. So this cellar was served for cold, for the freezing things too. But this, to get into the cellar was not from inside, it was from outside on the street. So he figured out he'll make the cellar smaller. To get into the cellar, his sister lived on the ground floor. We lived one flight up. He figured out where his sister's apartment is. And in the kitchen, there was a, it was a huge stove, a building stove. He figured out exactly where to cut out a hole underneath the stove so we should be able to roll into the cellar. But then he realized if we roll in, we're going to fall too deep below. So he made a platform from wood, put some bedding in. So, but the hole was round, just enough to crawl in and to fall on the board. The cellar had a new wall. So he painted, where did he get the merchandise to build? Don't forget he worked in the lumber yard. So he had, he had bricks and mortar and whatever else he needed. Once he was caught with these things going home, of course he wound up by the Gestapo, and I guess they wanted to know what he needs it for, whatever he gave the reason, they didn't kill him, but they beat him up, that he couldn't walk home. My mom had to come in the evening, look for him, find him and bring him home. He was, he was broken, but he knew if he stays home for more than two days, they will come and pick him up and put him on the train and he'll never return. So he called back to work and that's how he went back to work and he was able to finish that hiding place. Sure enough, that same guy comes and tells my father, I think it's gonna be this weekend. Usually they would do it in a weekend. He comes home that Friday night and, and tells us that we're going to the hiding place and we eat dinner. We all four of us go into it. And his sister with three, two boys and a baby girl, an infant baby girl go into hiding place. He, and she, my aunt takes a pillow for the baby in case she cries to put on top of her. My, grand, my paternal grandfather, my father's father lived with my, with my aunt. He says, I don't want to go. I'd rather die here than die, watch you die. We go in hiding, Friday night. Sure enough, Saturday morning, we hear the Germans screaming with their boots and knocking on doors, around everybody out, out, chasing, grabbing, throwing the, in their dog, screaming, chaos. They picked everybody out. Then they come into my aunt's apartment where my paternal grandfather was in the house. They say to him, come. He says, no, no problem. They shoot him and we heard it. My father knew when his father was killed. We're sitting very quietly. We're hoping it's quiet. The, the house became quiet, so we hope they left. But late, late in the afternoon, the big cellar door opens up. I was not the youngest, but I was a little too far away from my mom. All I did is do very, very quietly, just like this, huh, quiet. The Germans heard a noise. Because when they opened that door, I kind of got scared. My mom grabbed my hand. My aunt put a pillow on the infant. We all of us stopped breathing. The Germans are starting to come down the stairs with the flashlight. And as they're coming down, a big cat jumps out. You hear that, Samantha? I told you, a cat doesn't know me anything. A big cat, and gives a big meow. And the Germans start laughing. Oh, it's only, it's only a cat, it's only a cat. And they walk 
right out. So we realized we are okay for this time and we're waiting till it subsides so we can get down, we waited a day or two. When we finally came out, we realized who we're missing, who was alive. Um, going back to the cat, I don't want you to think, so I years, I asked my father, did you put the cat in there? He says, no, that's a cellar. There's mice there, there's rats, there's anything you name it, and there was food there, there's always cats there. So well, did you tell the cat to go out? He says, are you kidding me? What, where could I? But we were very lucky. The cat decided to jump out. What can I tell you? But I love telling that story because it's, um, it shows you that human life is hanging on us on, 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 a, on a, such a thin thread that a meow for my cat made the difference. That's all I can say. Anyway, to make the story further, the Germans announced that they're going to relocate the remainder Jews to Lvov. Lvov had maybe 30,000 Jews in a huge ghetto. So everybody says, we'll go there. The remaining Jews, it's not enough for them to keep here. We'll be working there. My father comes home and says to my mom, I don't believe them and we are not going. She says, you don't believe them? He says, no, I don't believe them. I'm not going. Where are we gonna go? She's, he says, I can't think right now, but we're not going. And he relates his feelings to the remaining of the family. By that time, my father's family was all gone. My mother's family, she still had a sister, two brothers, one was married and had a child, a, a boy, and her mother was still alive. He tells them that he is not going and they all say, what do you mean? Okay discussion, he says, I am not going because I do not believe that they're going to take us there. What are we going to do? Finally, he decides, I'm going to look someone to hide us. My uncle says, no, he's going to go to Lvov. My aunt says she had two younger children than I was. One was four, one was six. I was past eight then, maybe close to nine. And my sister was 12. We have four children. And we are gonna, and my, and my grandmother goes with us. So we all decided to go together. So we, they're both looking for someone to hide us. They look and they find, they find a woman. Her name was Stephanie Strzok. She had two children, a 19 year old daughter, and a 16 year old son. She had no husband. The husband worked on the train. He was the one who drove the train to Russia and he never came back. So she was alone. So where do you go in hiding? So each half, she lived in center of town, center. She was a very, she was not a plain simple uh, person of that. Very nice family, she had a nice family, she had sisters, she had brothers, they had a bakery, she had parents. She was, she was very nice, a very nice woman. So she, so she had every house in Europe, even if it's in the center of town, has a garden in the back of the house and then a barn. So my father says, we'll make the barn a little smaller. Can make it, it's very small to begin with, we nine people. So he says, we'll make it four feet by four feet. I want you to think four feet, nine people. That's five people this way, four people. The length of a person and the width of whatever you need of four feet, five people. If one person turned at night, all nine of us had to turn. He makes this divider. He gives her money. He had no money, but he had material. That's what he saved, and that's that, that saved our lives. He gives her one sack of materials, and he says to her, buy livestock. So she bought a pig and chicken. This way you have an excuse to bring food to the barn. When this, when this was ready, since we didn't know when, when the Germans are going to decide to, to put us on the train and take us to Lvov, the children, we, we are, the children and women went in hiding earlier. The men said they're going to work till the last, till as long as they feel they can. We were all in hiding there. And then all of a sudden there was a chaos. So evidently, why was there chaos? The people must have felt that Something is not kosher here. They, the German must have been lying. The way they were picking up the people, rushing them, hurry up, hurry up, pushing them to go on the train. 
my father and my uncle barely made it to the hiding place because it was such a chaos. My single uncle wanted to join us, but he couldn't. He was caught in the chaos. They picked everybody up, put them on the train, send them away. My, my, two, my father and my uncle made it to the hiding place. She comes in two weeks later, Stephanie, and tells her there wasn't a single Jew left in Khodorov. Everybody was put on a train. So my father asks her, what did they do with the train? Where did the train go? She says, I don't know. Okay. She said, sit quiet. Of course we're sitting quiet. Her children did not know about us. The only food she was able to bring us, excuse me, would be potatoes and bread. She had an excuse to buy, her sister had a bakery, so she would buy the old bread. She had an excuse to buy bread because she had a pig and chickens. So we, we could do nothing in the hiding place. Maybe, so we would go in during the day and you, everybody would go stretch our legs, go back, sit in the hiding place. Because there was a divider, we could open up, look in. Maybe three months into the hiding place, no more than that, three adults are standing and stretching their backs, their body and the rest of us are looking in what's going on and the pig and the chickens are the next corner all of a sudden the barn door opens up stephanie standing in front and a ukraine police right there on the right side looking in she knew that she has jews so in the barn is pitch dark when she opened that door the sun was in it blinded the, the Ukraine's police eyes for sure, but also the chicken and the chicken and the pig was started running towards the door because the, the sun was right there. So he was looking to the left while she's looking at us and she's frozen. She can't act. She realized three people are standing and the pig is running. It's 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 a scene. Now, I wish. I wish I could paint that scene, the fear and her and the fear and us is, is indescribable. She closes the door, the barn door finally, goes away, comes back a couple of hours later and tells us we have to leave. She can't take any chances. She's afraid the kids don't know, you gotta go. She's giving us two days, you gotta go. We have no place to go. My mom and my aunt get dressed with their like babushkis to knock on neighbors' houses and going further out, no one there to even answer the door. We have to get dressed, we have to leave. There is a, there is a forest. We are in center town. So we have to pass the other half of town to get to the forest. So we have to pass the town. Then there was a lake, but the lake is not deep, you can cross it. After the lake, still a walk and there is a forest. And there were some people who survived in the forest. A bunch of young people from Khodro, two, they had two, hot, two bunkers. One bunker was caught and one bunker survived. So you could do it. That's what we plan to do. But as we're getting dressed to go, my father says to my mom, I think Betty is old enough not to go with us. So what are you, what are you thinking? He says to my mom, Betty is old enough. So what does he do? He gives a, take, take two, three addresses that he has people that know him all his life. And he says to her, Betty, listen, this, one of these will take you, take you, you and Toby will go to this addresses. They will take you. I know they will hide you. One of them will hide you. But I want you to know, I know the war will end. I don't know when. If we don't come back with the forest, he was three at ad two addresses. If I know people are going to come looking for survivors, but here was two addresses that we have family. We have family in Palestine. I had an aunt. My mom had a sister. My father had a brother. I'll go back for two minutes to tell you how they got there. In 1937, they had a visa. So the two, they belonged to the Zionist organization. They were single. They had a visa. They were able to run away to Palestine. And then some two cousins my father had, they were able to get out to United States. These are the two addresses my father gives my sister. 
and tells her the instructions. If we don't come back, what her job, and he knows that people are gonna look for us. My aunt and uncle could not do the same with their children, they were too young. However, I want to show you who Stephanie was. She wasn't, an, she didn't hide us for money. This you have to know. We didn't have any. She realized that we're going to go and she realized that we have a small chance, nine people to walk to a forest and make it, even in the forest. So she goes back to this Ukraine police and says to him, you know who I am, you know my parents, you know my sister. Why did you come? What are you looking for? He says, Mrs. Strzok, you bought livestock. My job is to register it. That's all I came from. So she realizes he did not see. That as my father tried to tell her, go check it. And she finally did. As she's walking home, she knows we're leaving tonight and she has no heart to chase us. She comes home. She has a daughter of 19. Her name is Stephanie. And then son of 16, his name was Tajik. She tells the two children who she has in the barn for the last three months and what happened the afternoon and that we're leaving tonight. The 16 year old boy, his name is, is Tajik, turns to mom and says, you can't chase them, they'll never make it. I will help you, maybe together we can save them. She says no and he says yes but I guess he won because as we are dressed to leave the barn, the big barn door opens up, a skinny little 16 year boy standing there and says to us, my name is Tajik and you're not going any place. You're staying here, but I'll make a better hiding place. This is not good. You can't sit here. And he did. He went two steps higher at the barn on the loft and he made it bigger. He put more hay. There I could stand, not my parents, but we could sit comfortably. We could lay down comfortably. And what barn is made from panels. And what he did for us four children in the center barn on one panel, he cut down only the inside. So we should four children be able to see the, what's going outside. That's what we spent for two years. We had mice, lice, rats, forget it. First year, second year, we got along well. The main issue was food. And every single day was a survival day. My father never changed his view on autumn. He never changed his religion. He stayed what he was and he died the same way. His belief was, he used to say, don't blame God, because my, my uncle was to say to my father, this is your God. And my father said, it's not God's fault. It's humanity fault. God gave people choices. This Stephanie made a choice to save us. These people made different choices. We can't blame God. He blamed humanity. He had a calendar. Every single day marked what we did. Too bad that I didn't have, I didn't take it, we didn't take it. When he went in hiding, the only thing he took with him was the talit, that you, that a man prays it, and the tefillin that you put on your hand and top, and material, one sack full of material. In case she gets short of material, what he gave her, he always had something to give her, which it happened. But he had this firm belief that some, he used to say to us, somebody has to survive. No way can all of us die. And someone will have to tell the world this story. And we're going to be, maybe it's us. Every single day he would say, today it was us. Every single day was a miracle. I'll give you two examples and I'll go on. Once my uncle wanted to see what time in the middle of the night was. So he had a flashlight, of course, he puts it on. And right away outside, there was police looking around our barn. Where did it come from? Tajik was there outside with his flashlight. He watched the barn 24 hours. Once his friends 
sitting in the, the yard and playing. One of his friends takes a step ladder, puts it against the wall and stop climbing. And Taji got scared if he goes close by and puts his head, his head against the wall, he might see something. So what does he do? He grabs the step ladder out under his legs and says, what do you think I have there? I'm hiding Jews. Come and show you. The barn door is open. He dared them. So nobody would sus suspect them. Second year in hiding, Stephanie took in German officers to live in her house. Our barn door was open. They walked in and out many times. Many times she would leave the food. If we didn't pick it up right away, if they walked in, they would find food. Once they walked in, the food was gone, but our top where we close, where we have to close the opening, if they pick their head up, they would. Every single day, there's a, a Jewish expression, shia, shia, almost, almost, every single day was an almost. And the last months was very bad in hiding because the bombing was horrible. So she said, I'm taking my children, I'm leaving. She left the Germans living. Every, every house around us was bombed, except hers was standing and our barn was standing. So my father got scared. She is gone. The Germans are there. If we lose our roof, we won't, we almost making it. She said, we got to find another hiding place. So what does she do? So barn is earth, not concrete, earth. So he said, well, well so how do we, we have nothing to dig in, so, but we have, we had two pails for waste. Much waste we didn't have because we had very little food. But we, so whenever we have to use the waste, we would leave it outside, touch it, would empty it, would pick it right up. So with these two pails, he dug, and my father dug another hole in the, in the barn as we walk in, inside. And the earth went all the way up to the top where we were in hiding. So in case we lose our roof, we should have where. So that's where we were when we heard the Russians speaking. We couldn't believe our ears and and it was the russians so i'm not i'm not giving you much more details because time is running and i don't know i want to finish a little bit more so when the russians walked in we we heard them speaking we came out first was my father calling out and he said and they looked at us and i said if we were very hungry because the last few weeks we had no food at all only thing we ate was what my parents used to go out in the garden, find a carrot, salad, whatever there was in the garden. So they said to us, if you eat, you will die. They gave us a bottle of whiskey and they said, we'll take you a place where they can nourish you. So we split, we went someplace else, my aunt went someplace else, he knocks on that door that he knew the people. She was shocked to see us alive, but she took us in and she gave us a bag, boy. I still feel the bad. After two years of bad, and she gave us clean sheets and put us to bed and she nourished us. It didn't take long. We were very anxious to, to get well, to get out, to see who else survived. It took, I don't know how long, maybe two weeks or three weeks. We were out, we came out. 31 people survived their holiday. Nobody came back from any place. 30, 30, 30, not all were hiding, Some, most were hiding by non -pe by people, but one group of young people, must be maybe at least seven or eight, they were hiding in the forest. They were young, young, young single guys with women. We, the Russian, we were liberated in 1944, a full year earlier than the war ended. So, we stayed with the Russians. We stayed in Hollywood for a full year. When the war ended, just like my father said, they're going to come looking for survivors to get us out. And the Russians let us out. That's a story by itself to cross borders and borders and borders. And, and, and no we, 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 said we were not allowed to speak because we were Greeks. And each, each border we crossed, we were different people crossing. But what I do remember very clearly, when we when we passed Vienna, it was one hotel that not only not only us there, not only our transport was there, but many others. 
and we each one had a little corner of sleeping and at night. And when we got out of Hodorov, we had nothing. Whatever my father had, whatever money he had left, he made a coin out of it, a gold coin. So that coin, he used to say to us, if we ever hungry, that coin will save our life. So to cross borders, to, to cross with the coin, he didn't know where to hide it. So he made like a can, since I was the youngest in the family, to so make a tin can for me to put my toys and pencils, whatever, not toys, pencils, crayons. He made a double layer and put that gold coin into that layer. And I was supposed to watch, I am the youngest of all of them. At that time, I was what, I'm 44? In 45, I was 11 years old. I was 133, 43, yeah, 11 years old. So I am the youngest, and I'm supposed, he says to me, you watch that box, because if we get to the other side, when we are free, we have money to buy food. If we lose this, we don't have anything to eat. So at 11, I became responsible, and I'm still responsible today, the same way. You can trust me when I have to do something. We came to we came to oh, we came to the American zone. My aunt and uncle stayed on in Poland. They said they have to educate the children. I'm gonna go back for two minutes. What we did, I forgot to tell that what we did in hiding. My father made sure that I learned the uh, the, a, the ABC and then the alphabet. And he made sure that I, that I know the multiplication table. My grandmother was teaching me and my sister knit to knit and crochet. And we used to knit and crochet. She used to give us old sweaters. We would rip them, make new sweaters, and she made for them. So that I learned. But my father always said, his teaching to us was we can't, we can't forget, we must remember, but we can't hate. This is the teaching that I do now in schools. I say, anyway, I get to tell you what a little bit what we did in hiding. Going back to to forty five, we uh, so I wound up in the in the DP camp, displaced person camp in the in, in the Vienna area in Abelsberg, close to Vienna, close to Linz, from forty five to forty nine. We had teachers right away. Hebrew teachers, Israeli teachers, you name it, Polish teachers, teach the children. So we had art for the older ones to learn a trade, like my husband, he learned a trade, but the younger kids, schooling. You have to teach the children, you have to educate the children, educate the children. So we lived in the barracks, in the, the army barracks. We had run one room, the kitchen one end, and the bathroom the other. But let me tell you, this was the best years of my life, from 45 to 49. My freedom. I could jump, I could talk, I could, I could laugh, I could in, in hiding. We didn't cry, we didn't laugh, we didn't sneeze, we didn't cough, we didn't do anything. Learn to keep quiet. Now I'm learning to talk. I'm learning to express. And I loved everything about it. So 49. 49, all the doors opened up to go everywhere. We decided to go to, we wanted to go to Palestine, to Palestine, at the time we was still Palestine. My aunt and uncle talked my parents out of it because they said, we can't help you. You have no trade. What are you gonna do here? Go and it's gonna be easier for you. So my father decided to go to the United States. So where does my father go? Everybody goes north. All my friends go north, New York, Boston, New York, Maryland. He goes south. Why are you going south? All my friends are going north. He's going the opposite direction. Because he remembered the Russian immigrants, 1900s, came to the United States. They all became peddlers. Peddler is you, you, you take something, you sell, you go knock on the door, you sell it one week, every week you come collect a dollar. He says, that's what I want to be. And that's what I'm going to be in the South. 
That's why we went to New Orleans. But it, it was definitely right for him because he did what he wanted to do. It was difficult for me and my sister because we had friends and here we are. So I was 16 and a half when I came to New Orleans. We were two weeks on the General Black on the ocean. It was horrible. It wasn't a luxury boat with an army, an army boat. But we came to New Orleans. I was like, something was lifting off my chest. Finally, we could be in a place that we can make home. And I look at the streets and the lights and the, and the vibration of the people. The, the people don't look sad. Everybody looks happy. And I say to my father, what took you so many years to come here? Why couldn't you have left earlier? Excuse me. He turns to me and says, okay, now we're here. Let's make it now. We do not go back. We go forward. And we don't forget either who you are. We have to go forward. He always kept saying we have to go forward. So we come to New Orleans a week, a, a week I think, before Rosh Hashanah, just like now. And my father was religious, so he says to the woman, she spoke Yiddish, she says to him, I need a kosher meal. I need a, a, a shoe that I can walk to, not travel, and I gotta be an orthodox. She says, no problem, I'll find you a home. She finds us a home that we stay, gonna stay in. You know, I need to talk about that for two minutes because this also is something that is difficult. When, you win, when you're within your own peers, you look human. We are all the same. You know, when survivors meet, even as young as we were, the first question is, where were you? How'd you make it? That's the connection. You come, I come to New Orleans. There are very few survivors there because only a handful, and we didn't see them yet. So here, I mean, I'm already in a different environment. So we come to this gorgeous Jewish home, religious because it was it was Yom Tif, it was holiday, it was Rosh Hashanah, and. We, address, we thought we dressed properly, but according to them, we looked like schnorros. And let me tell you, before my grandmother, or my, my mom's mother did not want to go to the United States. So when we decided to go to the United States, she went to Israel to her daughter. She says, I want to die in, Israel, in Palestine. And that time was Palestine. So we were only four. I look, I'm looking at my mom and my father, my sister, and I'm looking at these people and I'm kind of shocked the difference, we, how different we look. Not just in clothing, in features. Our faces are sad. Our eyes are sad. So anyway, we sit down and I feel like, you know what, if, if there was a hole there, I would bury myself for the moment. A very, and you know, I wasn't just myself feeling my mom and my, felt the same way we're sitting down to the meal and we make a bracha whatever they did and the man says do you um to my father do you want to say so i don't know i don't remember the exact conversation all i know my father got up he started wanted to say whatever he started to say the man says to him motion stop you're here now you have to go forward. We realize that the American Jews are not interested to hear, and we have to pick up our pieces and make a life. And that's what the survivors did. The same thing happened in New York as in the South. American Jews did not want, took many, many years till they wanted to hear what's going on. And especially the hidden children or the hidden people definitely came very late into speaking. That, ex that experience told me this is what it is. And maybe it is the good thing. I think psychologists are still discussing it. This might have been the right thing because, this, because the survivors did succeed. They succeeded with their children, with education, especially with their children. Wow, it's unbelievable. So that's the good part. 
I, should I stop? Um, well, we have just a few minutes left, and I know, Toby, that uh, you have to leave promptly. I can leave plenty. Okay, you want to know about my, who I am? I was married very young. I came to, United, to New York after a while. I married very young, at 19, almost 19 and a half, almost 20. My husband was a survivor, too. We have two children, a son and a, and a daughter. They're both very highly educated. My son is a doctor. My daughter is a therapist. I have three grandchildren from my daughter, all Jewish, married Jewish. My son married late, but he has two young, I have two younger grandchildren, so I'm starting all over with younger grandchildren. So when I, when I speak to children in classes, I try to teach them and tell them that hatred is not, should not be in a, in, in a person's you can have to remember and go forward. This is why the survivors were able to make it. They don't have hatred. What, I'll tell you one example. One teenage girl, a high school girl, asked me if I ever wanted revenge. I was kind of shocked a little bit, revenge. I said, I have my revenge. I'm surviving and I'm here. I tell the story and I repeat it and I'm teaching and I, I'm, I'm fulfilling my father's wishes when he says, if we make it, it's our job to tell. So I am Jewish. I have Jewish children and grandchildren and great grand. I have three great grandchildren, Jewish, all Jewish. I get a letter from her later. She says, I never knew you can have revenge without killing. To me, I think I tell it all the time because it shows me that you can teach not to hate. I taught her you can have revenge without killing. I'll stop here unless, yes. I am, in, my parents were never always in touch with Stephanie and her children, never forgot them. But we never had anything to give till we came to United States. When we did, we sent her what she needed. She always wanted material. Tajik unfortunately died young. We think the Chernobyl explosion might have killed him. I am still in touch with Stephanie's great-granddaughter. I still send money to her till today. I will always do it. I will never, ever forget them. I get up with them and I go to sleep with them. And they, of course, they are in, in Jerusalem and Yad, Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations. I think I covered a lot. Yes, you covered so much. Oh my I God. Try, I try not to cheat you. What a powerful story. Everyone in the audience, you can't hear them, but if, if you could see the room full of people right now, I'm sure Thank their faces you. would be amazed and applauding you. Whatever uh, I've got, I will tell you next time. How's that? Yes, absolutely. Um, we are so fortunate to have you in our Speakers Bureau. We, we so <laughs> love hearing Thank you. Thank having me. We love having you, and I want to wish you a sweet and happy Rosh Hashanah, Shana Tova, to you, Toby. Same to you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much to everyone in our audience. Once again, this program was recorded. You can listen to it again. It'll be on YouTube, and I'll send out a link to that um, sometime sorry, tomorrow. I'm sorry I took so long. I didn't give you time for questions. I no think need I to apologize. I think I covered a lot. Absolutely. You, you definitely did. No Thanks need to everybody. I wish everybody a healthy, happy new year. And you, I always tell kids, you can make it. Only have to try a little harder. Thank you so much, Toby. Thank Beautiful you for day. listening. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach to you as well. Take care. We should have a better year than this year. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care.